another episode of the Oceans of Learning podcast series, celebrating our seas and raising awareness around the importance of Ireland's marine resources. I'm Finn van der Aar, and today we are focusing on our ocean, our climate. We all know that climate change um, is escalating at a massive rate and that human behavior has a profound effect uh, on our climate systems and our oceans. You might not know how much of a role the oceans actually play in climate systems and in terms of things like uptake of carbon and, and what it's going to mean, I guess, obviously for things like our weather systems and fisheries and going forward. So today we are going to dive into that with our fantastic panel of speakers. Joining me today is uh, Trina McGrath from Unforum Ishka, the, uh, the Water Forum. We have uh, Ken Whelan from the Atlantic Salmon Trust, and we have Samantha Hallam, uh, ocean and climate scientist from the University of Maynooth. So guys, you're all very welcome. And Trina, I am going to come to you first. Your amazing TED Talk in 2016 on ocean acidification has been viewed, I think, over 1.6 million times at this point, which is amazing. And you started that piece by saying, do you ever think about how important the oceans are in our daily lives? The oceans cover two thirds of our planet. They provide half the oxygen we breathe. They moderate our climate. They provide jobs and medicine and food, including 20% of protein to feed the entire world population. People used to think that the oceans were so vast that they wouldn't be affected by human activities. Well, today I'm going to tell you about a serious reality and that is, change, that is changing our oceans called ocean acidification or the evil twin of climate change. So that was five years ago. I'm, I'm very curious to know how have things improved? What are you looking at now? Well, I, I can, I'm not sure I can say, but how, how things have improved really, um, because it's it's no different to the, the, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You know, we, we can see that at that steadily increasing. Um, and as carbon dioxide builds up in the atmosphere, it, it also builds up in the ocean. And so um, from, let's say, if you're looking at the atmosphere, that's a good thing because um, the oceans have taken up about a quarter of all the, the, the carbon dioxide that we have emitted to the atmosphere over the last 250 years. So that's good for slowing down global warming. Um, but unfortunately, it's not a win-win situation because it changes the chemistry. And so um, as you add more CO2 to the ocean um, after a number of chemical reactions, which I won't bore you with now, um, but it, it lowers the pH and, and, and that's why it's called ocean acidification because it's, it's increasing the acidity. Um, so in a positive sense, I guess, is that we are, we're learning more. Um, so, you know, as the years go on, we're, we're learning more, we're get, gathering more data, we're um, able to feed into models to try and get an idea of what's happening in the future. Um, but I mean, I can't say we, we're seeing any positive changes from, from the chemistry in the ocean, unfortunately. Yeah. No, de no, definitely. I think it definitely more um, and even we're seeing it around like other topics and stuff as well, like fisheries at the moment. It's the, the one positive that we're grasping on is, is the fact that the awareness is starting to grow, but definitely maybe the science is not looking as positive. I'd be curious to know in terms of um, obviously a little bit in the Irish context, the kind of like impact on marine life here. Yeah, so um, it, in, when you look at, say, the amount of data that's been gathered, we were, we were kind of new enough um, in 2008. Um, the Marine Institute and NUI Galway started this pilot project to initiate carbon research in Irish waters. And so that was great. That was the start of my PhD. And we, we spent weeks at sea going across the, the, the continental shelf and across the Rockall Trough, and we were just gathering information. Um, and so that is a baseline. And we can't, it's even difficult over, even since then, to, to really look at trends in, in coastal waters or in, or in the continental shelf because. There's so much change within years. The interannual variability is high. You really need long-term time series to, to tease out the changes that are due to human activity. So, but we were able to, um, as part of that pilot project, we collected data across the Rockall Trough, that, that deep channel west of the, the continental shelf. Um, and there were samples, carbon chemistry samples, collected as part of the World Ocean Circulation Experiment in this area in the 1990s. So we were able to look at decadal changes then in carbon chemistry. Um, and so what we, what we found in this, uh, this research was that, well, the carbon dioxide was building up in the surface ocean at the rate that we were expecting based on um, atmospheric levels and also looking at trends that they're seeing in some of the global time series. So there's some big ones that are going on for much longer that we learn so much from. So there's ones in Bermuda and Hawaii and Iceland. Um, and, and these ones we're able to look at, you can see that, that the, the carbon in the ocean is, is steadily increasing. It's coinciding with the steady decrease in, in, in pH. 
but when, when you're talking about it's difficult to relate to that because you can't see i mean we can't see the carbon in the ocean we can't see um the changes and so it's difficult for people to relate to to what's happening it doesn't look like a problem but the problem is that as you, one of the chemical changes um is that it reduces carbonate ions and they are basically the building blocks for for marine species that make shells or say coral skeletons they all require these in the water around them and so as you add more co2 these building blocks and the availability of them goes down and so what the research is indicating is that you're getting slower growth rates and um, weaker structures and there is a point that actually the, the shells would actually begin to dissolve, which is which oh, is wow. obviously the worst case scenario. So yeah. um, so from an Irish point of view, um, we're really just seeing the um, that we are seeing that the same trends. Um, there has it, it's tricky in the coastal system because um, coastal waters have so much more going on. Exactly. Yeah. And there's so many other pressures and there's there's so much coming off the land that can change things in both directions. Um, and yeah. one of the, the uh, research that we did two years ago was that we, we were looking at seasonal changes in different coastal systems. And we actually found that catchments that have a limestone bedrock, which are, you know, there's a lot of them uh, around Ireland. Um, the West Coast. Yeah, they're able to buffer some of, um, I mean, they, they've higher uh, saturation of calcium carbonate because it's coming from the bedrock. Okay. And so there, there may be a thought that these areas could be better able to buffer future okay. acidification but i mean it's very it's difficult to know from just a couple of seasons yeah. that we sample so oh completely um, yeah completely and um and ken actually just kind of obviously what with trina we're talking about the the kind of ocean chemistry side of things what would you be seeing um kind of more of a biological consequence when you're looking at fisheries yeah, I think uh, for anybody who's planning a staycation this year, probably best to start with an example. If you go uh, or happen to be in the area of County Waterford and go to Dungarvan, there's a spit in Dungarvan called the Conagher. So if you go out along the Conagher at low water as the tide is coming in, um, if it's a calm day, you will literally see a mile of fish. And these fish are what we call golden grey mullet. And uh, when I started working, I replaced a very famous biologist called Michael Kennedy. And he spent his career uh, interested in fish in general, but mullet in particular. He never found a golden gray mullet in Irish water and waters. And there are thousands of them, hundreds of thousands of them along the Conagher, all dipping the surface and so on. Mixed in with them are Mediterranean sea bream. Even the word Mediterranean will give away what I'm going to say because these fish lavish co uh, warm water. If you go to West Cork, you'll find trigger fish. Need I say any more? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's it's not something that needs, thankfully, we're not in a situation where Trina is trying to explain quite complicated chemistry. People can use their eyes and they can actually see the changes. So basically what's happening is all of that warm water, we think, is moving northwards. And we now have a fish fauna off the south and southwest coast of Ireland that's more similar to the east coast of the US 40 years ago than it is to what we would have encountered in those areas. That's so amazing. in reality, this is a very, very major change. And it's certainly having very, uh, um, very serious impacts in terms of the location and the abundance of various fish species. And, and I guess I love that you gave a context there for us, um, for people kind of going on holidays and what they're going to see in the next couple of months. Um, I guess, what kind of effect would you say that's going to have on the commercial fishing sector? I think what we're seeing at the moment is, again, it's like the models that uh, uh, Trina was mentioning. It's unpredictability. I don't think anyone can foresee what's going to happen in the future. So take, for example, a very common fish, mackerel. We saw over the last 10, 20 years, a huge shift westwards in the, in the mackerel abundance. So in reality, it's not that the mackerel as such have disappeared. They've disappeared from certain locations. And the reason for that is changes in currents. The changes in currents are leading to a situation where the food abundance is actually in different locations. So in reality, what you have is a very confused picture, uh, both in the surface of the ocean and even in the deeper layers, confusing for us. But the fish can move with that. But the movement of the fish leads to all sorts of concerns, obviously, because commercial fisheries can be affected. But also what uh, Trina was mentioning in terms of the acidification, very often people see pictures of a coral that's bleached by the acidification. Think of the little planktonic creatures that have a hard silicate shell that are in the surface layers of the ocean. 
think of acidification actually was making those very, very thin, or indeed, a, a, as Trina was said, where they can't make them at all. The impact of that on the base of food in the ocean would be absolutely enormous. So I think on all fronts, we need to be monitoring this very closely. And in Ireland, we could not be in a better position to do this. We're on the outer edge of Europe. We're on the divide between the cold northerly species of fish and the more southern warm water species. So the work that my colleagues, I used to work for the Marine Institute, so my colleagues, and the, uh, former colleagues rather now in the Marine Institute, the work they're doing is exemplary uh, in terms of using our wonderful research ships to look at this and to monitor this. And really um, in our game, if you don't have 10 years of data, you're not at the races. You need 50 <laughs> years of data even to make a statement. Yeah. So these are very long term. Uh, these are very long term challenges, but we probably don't have time for that. And we'll have to interpret the data based on the best available information. But it's all about change and it's all about unpredictability. Yeah. And Samantha, See, I guess kind of talking about that unpredictability, um, could you tell us a little bit more about kind of what you're seeing in your own climate and uh, ocean research in terms of looking at the Gulf Stream, but also maybe looking at, I guess, those changes in weather patterns? Yeah, so, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, uh, so I'm a postdoc researcher in the Irish Climate Analysis and Research Unit at uh, Maynooth University. So uh, my particular um, area of interest is looking at how ocean variability impacts on North Atlantic storminess, uh, with a, looking at hurricanes, a jet stream, um, and what impact that has on Ireland and the UK. And certainly, in particular looking, as was just mentioned there, about the ocean circulation changes um, relating to the Gulf Stream system. So for those who don't know who are listening to this podcast, the Gulf Stream system is part of what we call the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, um, which is a large system of the ocean currents in the North Atlantic where the warm salty waters from the tropical Atlantic are transported northwards at the surface. Uh, first by the Gulf Stream and then by the North Atlantic Current, um, where, they, where they move northwards to the Greenland and Norwegian seas. And that's where they are cooled by the atmosphere, become dense and then sink, and the um, cooler waters flow further southwards. And it's this which the movement of the cooler waters moving southward then pulls more um, warmer surface waters um, northwards. And this whole system is, is what we call the AMOC um, or the Gulf Stream system. And it's driven by density differences which are caused by temperature and salinity differences. So the causes of the variability, I guess, in the AMOC or the Gulf Stream system is obviously what lots of people are researching, um, but in part it's very likely associated with climate change. So in a warming climate, which is obviously what we're seeing, there's the increase in sea ice melt um, in the Arctic, um, which means that the waters around Greenland become warmer, um, less salty, um, and so that means that you get um, less cool dense waters flowing southwards and that means that this then drags less warmer waters um, northwards. So um, what we're seeing with a warming climate is a reduction um, in the Gulf Stream system and a slowing of the whole of the um, AMOC um, in the North Atlantic. And I guess what like what kind of effect would we see on Ireland's climate systems then with that slowing? Okay, so there's there's many um, impacts. I, mean, I guess some of it is short term and some of it is long term. Mm -hmm. um, what we're seeing, so the Gulf Stream um, system, the AMOC system, is very important for temperature distribution. Um, so there was some um, amazing research which was done by um, Lefka Caesar or led by Lefka Caesar, um, who's part of the team at Maynooth, um, and it went back to 400 AD. Um, which, you know, in terms of what you were just saying there, you know, we need records that go back much further in time. That's a good and data set. <laughs> it's a good, yes, it is a good data set. And it, okay, it was proxy data. But what it showed is that, you know, up until the start of the 19th century, the AMOC was fairly consistent. Then there was a significant uh, start of the weakening. But since the mid 19th century, there's been a far more rapid um, weakening of the AMOC system. So that in the last couple of decades, it's sort of at its weakest um, level based on these proxy records that's ever seen before. Now the Gulf Stream is really important though for temperature distribution. So certainly here um, in Ireland, um, it, it's around four degrees warmer 
um, than you would expect to see at limit similar latitudes. So for example, Sli Sligo in Ireland at 54 north has got palm trees. Whereas if you were at 54 degrees south down in South Georgia, um, there's glaciers. Yeah. for example so I you think, know don't they um they use the example that we're aren't we on a line with moscow and we obviously have much less extreme temperature differences than them exactly very much so but as i was saying it so the gulf stream varies it, um on a seasonal to decadal basis so when we have seen we we, we know from our research if we see a slowdown in the amoc in the winter time typically february march that builds up to a, um, a build up of heat in the tropical atlantic at 20 to 40 uh, 10 to 20 north um, and that leads to very active hurricane seasons um, through the transfer of heat from the ocean um, into the atmosphere which actually fuels the hurricane so we know that there was a slowdown in the AMOC in the winter of 2004 and 2009 and what that meant was we have very active hurricane seasons in 2005 and 2010 but in terms of Ireland, um, Ireland actually experienced its coldest winter for 50 years in the winter of 0910 and that was related to the slowdown of the Gulf Stream in that particular yeah. year as um, the North Atlantic was much colder that year. I remember we actually looked at that one specifically um, in college. Um, Ken, you are the research director of the Atlantic Salmon Trust. I was reading an interesting book uh, lately, I think by Mark Kalansky, specifically on salmon, obviously more in North America, but it was kind of talking about how they're being used as a, a very good example, kind of keystone species to see how an ecosystem is doing. Could you tell us a little bit about that, maybe in the Irish context? Yeah, I, I, certainly. I, I think I could make quite a good pitch in terms of... Uh, the salmon as what we call a sentinel species. Yeah. Because for example, if we were to fund a train and Sam to take the Celtic Explorer and head out into the ocean, you know, it's going to cost something like, if I'm up to date, about 17,000 euro a day. So really what they'd be doing is traversing those layers that were so well described by Sam, those layers of the currents and layers of the ocean and trying to find out what was happening. So we actually have now a creature uh, that's been around for about 10,000 years in Ireland that basically will travel from the top of a mountain to Greenland and back and comes back into your hands that actually picks up all of the clues. So salmon, when they're migrating at sea, have a great liking for traveling near the surface. So because they travel near the surface, they're very prone to the effects of surface warming, which is a very key feature in terms of, in terms of climate change. And as they move along and as they feed on various um, organisms in the ocean, chemically clues are actually uh, they're actually held by say for example the scales or the ear stones of the fish that we can now delve into with very very clever genetics and look and see exactly where the fish were, uh, were were feeding in the ocean but the interesting thing is that the the big currents that sam was talking about they're really important initially in terms of getting the baby salmon from ireland to their first feeding zone in in norway but also critical to, the, to, to these fish and many other surface uh, feeding fish of the ocean are currents that are actually uh, caused by wind. So the surface currents that are directed by the wind, we found in research we did many years ago, that these were critical. So if you get a climate change shift in terms of wind direction and wind strength, particularly at the time of the year when the fish are migrating and they're very small, they're no more than about 12 or 15 centimetres, they're more or less trapped within these giant ocean currents in terms of moving northwards. But in within the currents, they can be deflected at the surface by these surface currents. So all of that leads to a situation, again, of confusion and loss in some particular years. And we're seeing these huge um, changes in terms of the survival. So in one year, it looks as if things are actually starting to improve. In other years, it's catastrophic. But overall, we used to see 25 or 30 salmon come back out of every 100 smolts. We're very, very lucky now to see seven or eight. And more normally, wow. it's closer to five. So that is a massive drop. And obviously, it has a lot of features to it. It's not just the ocean issues, but the ocean issue is certainly a, a very big issue in terms of this overall decline. Completely. And, and in terms of like the, the resilience of them as a species, if they are being so like heavily affected by those currents of maybe not being able to return, like would that be affecting their ability to return to their own kind of spawning grounds? Would they be able to kind of inhabit new rivers instead or how would that work? 
Well, I think that's the fascinating thing. And, and this is now a kind of Ken Whelan theorizing, okay? But just to give you an insight in terms of what might be happening. I have a particular interest we were mentioning earlier there, Greenland, a particular interest in Greenland, because in Greenland at the moment, you have these enormous changes where the actual ice cap in Greenland is not reforming to anything like the same extent as it did in the past. As a result of that, we have new little rivulets that are actually appearing from the edge of the ice cap down into the ocean. Already, we have a species of fish called Arctic char nosing into these little streams for the very first time. And the theory is that in the past, during the ice age and as the ice age was disappearing, that salmon and char together nosed into these streams and began to colonize them purely to lay their eggs. So in reality, what salmon might do if we're in a situation where they're under increasing pressure, we have a straying rate of about eight to 10 percent. We may very well find that it's not so much that they'll disappear, but they'll disappear out of the areas we cherish them in. And they may find new homes in more northerly climes. And the other extraordinary thing is that if you look at a map of the Northwest Passage and you see how the ice is decreasing year after year after year, um, at times there's no more than about 600 miles, about a thousand kilometers now between feeding Atlantic salmon and feeding Pacific salmon on the other side. Mm -hmm. And we do know that under the ice and as the ice gets thinner, there's all sorts of jellyfish and so on making the transition from the Pacific to the Atlantic. So as these new waterways appear in Greenland and similar areas in the north, who knows what might happen in terms of hybridization, in terms of different species moving through. So from a biological point of view, it's absolutely fascinating. From a human point of view, it's really frightening. But you're torn between the being captivated by the story and at the same time being aware of just how dramatic this change is. So I like to say to my students when, I, when I'm teaching in this area, that really we are privileged to us in a strange way to perhaps be witnessing at this stage something that happened 10,000 years ago. And we might be able to understand better how the colonization in terms of these migratory fish happened. So it's a great story, but as I say, it's also a very clear indication that it could be catastrophic from a human welfare point of view. Amazing. And Trina, obviously, we talked a little bit there about um, on a few different angles about those kind of different layers uh, that we're seeing in the ocean. When we're looking at acidification, are we seeing um, across, say, depth layers or anything? Are we seeing kind of a uniform change or, or is it kind of very variable? Yeah, so th this, I think, um, links in with what Sam was talking about. The, the, the carbon uptake in the ocean globally is not uniform. So um, it's overall the oceans are a carbon sink but it, it kind of breeds in different places. So there's a carbon uptake um, in parts, for example, of the North Atlantic, but then there's a release of carbon in, in estuaries or in upwelling areas that brings cold water um, on, in the deeper waters. So basically the top, the surface layer is going to try and equilibrate with the overlying atmosphere. And so you'll, you'll often get, um, you know, that, that can take, you know, a few months or a year it, the amount, the transfer of carbon between the ocean and the atmosphere is, is, will depend on temperature. So colder waters will take up more carbon than warmer waters. So that's also a question that you could ask with as with the, the oceans warm, will we get less carbon uptake? And um, then again, if there's more storms, you get storminess and increased wind will mix those surface waters and that will actually help bring carbon from the atmosphere deeper into the, um, into the, into the surface fixed layer. Um, but the trouble is, if, if we are seeing a slowdown in, in say, the Gulf Stream um, and a change to these ocean circulations, we might see a very different um, distribution of carbon in the ocean. And that might, that might impact how much carbon is taken up. Because if you are not getting, for example, in the North Atlantic, if, if, if the water is not heavy enough to sink and to form North Atlantic deep water, then we may not get this draw of carbon away from the surface layer. And that could then indicate that you would have, we would have more carbon left in the atmosphere, which could accelerate global warming. Wow. So there's a lot to, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question, but it's not at all evenly distributed. And actually, um, again, like um, Ken was saying, Ireland is in a really good position where we can, we can look at a range of water masses. Because if you go off the continental shelf edge and you drop your sensors from the surface, all the way down to nearly, you know, to over 3,000 meters deep, 
you can see water bodies and water masses that have come from, say, the Mediterranean, uh, the Labrador Sea, you know, a mix of old water masses on the bottom, even some at the very bottom from Antarctica. And so you can look at the signatures, you can look at the carbon in there, the oxygen, the nutrients, and that can tell you a lot about the path that, that it's taken and how much carbon is in that. So it's a really interesting, um, amazing to see when you watch the sensors go down in the ship, the, the, the profiles, we'll say, of the, the different water masses mixing beneath the ship. Very cool. Yeah, it's like a very interesting intersection of a highway, um, yeah. of a water highway. And and the last question I'll, I'll put to you first, Trina, um, that we like to ask everyone on the show is um, obviously today climate change is a little bit of a heavy topic. Is is something for our twi- listeners that they can take away, um, maybe a positive thing, a piece of advice that they can do now to help protect our oceans? Well, I think the bottom line in a lot of problems at the moment is that we all need to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere. And I mean, a lot of people would think of the, the obvious ones of responsible travel choices and you know, energy efficient at home and also in the workplace. But I think one that maybe every single person can think about, and, and often it's not, it's not um, connected, but it's in your food and, and food waste, because a huge proportion of food that's produced is, is wasted, it's thrown out. And if you think, if you go to the shop, and you lay out all your items that you've just bought on the kitchen table and you check the origin of all of those, they each have a very high carbon footprint. They've probably all taken a flight or a lot of them have taken a flight and they've gone through you know, production and packaging and all the, the different logistics to get them to the supermarket. And then you've driven to the supermarket to pick it up. The worst thing you could do is throw that out because you've just wasted all of that, that those emissions. So I think if you can try and be more um, just better prepared at home to, to not waste food. And then if you can at all, to, to, to try and seek out some locally sourced food so you have less of a carbon footprint from that aspect. Thanks, Trina. Absolutely fantastic tips. And Samantha, same, same kind of question for yourself, a tip um, that our listeners can do now, um, something to help protect our oceans. Yeah, I would say um, very much the same thing. How can we reduce the amount of energy we all use on a daily basis and we need in our lives and I would just say you know the car journey versus a walk the one less coat clothes wash cycle per week you know but also the final one would be why don't you fix something instead of buying something new because energy goes into a lot of energy goes into buying something new whereas if you can just fix something recycle something use it in a different way um, that also reduces the amount of energy needed um, and it might save yourself some money too so, yeah. Amazing. Absolutely. And I think it's it's been really nice to see the, the kind of resurgence of some of the industries that support that kind of um, secondhand or keeping economy. We're getting our cobblers and our seamstresses and everything coming back to the fore now, which is fantastic. Um, so, Ken, uh, just to finish up with yourself, the, the same idea, something for our listeners to take away. Yeah. Can I go maybe not at the personal level, maybe at the community level, because I do a lot of work at the moment in terms of community groups and I'm bowled over by their enthusiasm and their interest in looking after their own water resources. I think really the whole thing is to do with the big P. It's to do with pressures on the ocean. So if you're in a situation where your coastal town is belching out untreated sewage, the impact on the ocean is very profound. If you're in a situation where uh, big marine fisheries are not properly regulated, the impact on the ocean is huge. So I think in reality, we have these creatures in the ocean that are superb at adapting, but they do need time and space. So we have to give these creatures time and space to adapt to the regime that we're actually forcing them through. And certainly in the context of the species that are natural to Ireland, the most important goal is cold, clean water. And that's really what these creatures are looking for. Whether we as a community locally can achieve that or not, we can certainly put our shoulder to the wheel by reducing pressures and by making our government conscious of the fact that this cold, clean water regime over the decades to come, we have to replace that because otherwise we just are in a situation where we have no idea what we're facing into. And probably the most important message is there is no vaccine for climate change. I love it. Um, Ken, Trina, Samantha, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. So there you have it, folks. Some fantastic advice and info from our expert panel all around how 
climate change is affecting our oceans and what that's going to mean for us for the decades to come. In next week's episode, our fourth and final episode of Oceans of Learning, we are going to look at the future of our oceans and research and technology, as well as some, how we are engaging the next generation. Do rate, review, subscribe wherever you're getting your podcast if you're enjoying so far. I'm Finn van der Aar, and we'll see you next time. Oceans of Learning, the podcast celebrating our seas and Ireland's marine resource is presented by the Marine Institute. To find out more, go to marine.ie.